Now turn to part one. Part one. We will hear a man talking first to a receptionist and then to a doctor at the health centre. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning. What can I do for you? Uh, yes, I'm currently visiting this area, but I injured myself when I was doing sport a while ago, and I still feel pain. So I wondered whether I could see a doctor here. Sure, sir. We can take you on as a temporary patient. I'll just take down some of your personal details. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Peter Smith. All right, Peter. And where are you currently staying here? At 95 Cross Street. And the county? Walkley. That's W A L K L E Y. Okay. And can I have a contact number? Uh, it's four six eight nine five three two four. Okay. Thanks. Can you just round there? The doctor will see you in a minute. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen and answer questions four to ten. Now, how can I help you? It's Peter Smith, isn't it? Yes, I had a sporting accident, and a doctor at home treated me, but I'm still getting some pain. Hmm. Right. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. Well, what sport were you doing when you got injured? Playing tennis with my friends. No, I see. Did you hurt your elbow or wrist? Oh no, I had my knee sprained, which was the original problem. Right, and when did this happen? Uh, that was three weeks ago now, so it was about June eighteenth. Hmm. And you said you had medical treatment at home. Uh, yeah. The doctor said I didn't need an X-ray or things like that, and he just told me to use an ice pack. Fine. Anything else? Yes, and I've been using a walking stick to help me get around. Right. Now, what problems are you having during walking? Well, actually, I can walk, yet I still can't go upstairs, so I've been sleeping downstairs. Hmm. Now, you said your knee still hurts. Well, no. Actually, it's getting better. It's my back hurting me now. It really aches at night, and I cannot sleep well. Hmm. I have several suggestions for you. Great. First, you should put the stick away, as that's probably the source of the problem. Oh really? I wish I'd know. After that, I can prescribe you something to relax the muscles in your back. Oh, sorry to be difficult, but I've had something like that in the past, and there were many side effects, and I don't want to take it. Would you recommend anything else? Well, yes, we do have a leaflet showing some exercises you can do yourself at home. If you do them every day, they'll soon be effective. Great, I'll do that.
That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a tour guide from Pine Garden giving visitors a general introduction to each part of the area. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to Pine Garden. My name is Manuel. Before you wander off and begin your exploration of the garden, I'm going to keep all of you informed of several things about this building. I know you're eager to start your wandering and exploring, so I will try to keep this as short as possible. Firstly, I think I should explain to you something that you can do with your ticket. If you're much more into nature, the optimal section is our planting area, where all the visitors can plant small flowers and bulbs on their own. These plants will gradually grow and then become part of our garden. The activities of planting are totally free. However, if your hands are sensitive, we strongly recommend you to buy a pair of garden gloves in order to protect your skin. Also here at Pine Garden, we use wooden materials from the trees that have been felled in our very own pine forest to make carved goods. If you are interested and want to get involved and try by yourself, you can join one of our bush timbering lessons for free, where you will have the opportunity to make your own keyring with the help of a skilled woodsman. Our aviary is the most popular attraction, where you can see a whole range of bird species. More surprisingly, it is free to enter this section yet you should pay a small amount of supplement for the entry to the hummingbird section. Also, the insect section that is not very far from the aviary might arouse your interest. There you will find a number of interesting insects, such as butterflies, pocket ladybugs, dragonflies and so on, and there's no extra charge. Unfortunately, some areas are now temporarily limited to visitors today. For example, the gift shop that closed earlier this year will remain out of bounds for another month or so. As I have said before, the restaurant still offers free food and snacks for you, and if you do feel like purchasing a gift, why not buy that special potted bush or orchid from our plant care centre? What's more, our new treetop cafe is now in the process of construction. It will be very compelling when it's finished. Actually, our model town has already opened in advance. That is of great interest to the public. Also, our tourist office is ordinarily available to give tourists many aids, but the officer is sick at home. Please do not be disappointed by this, since our open visiting areas also provide quite an experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I'd also like to introduce our plant experts responsible for the wonderful plant exhibitions here at Pine Garden. Mrs. Mary is one of our specialists, who is personally in charge of our awesome displays that can all be found in the local wild nature. Mr. Burson is responsible for looking after varieties of plants that grow in much drier and hotter climates than ours, which is a difficult task although it does mean there's no need to conserve water for it. If you go into the glass house, there are a large number of plants that he has managed to grow without any need for rain or irrigation. Mr. Smith is in charge of keeping all the visitors fed at our restaurant. By growing varieties in the earth and on trees and bushes that are edible. Now, Mr. Nunny here is our specialist on the most universally growing plant in the world, grass. You may have noticed how beautifully green and lush our grounds are thanks to his specialist knowledge. Mr. O'Canlan guarantees our soil is compiled with nutrients. All the specialist habitats are hence supported and encouraged. He succeeded in doing this by fertilizing the earth with his special formula that he originally constructed by himself. Finally, I'd like to invite you all to meet Dr. Mandelson, the manager of our landscaping team who works closely with all the other experts to make sure everybody works together to create a landscape that is pretty as well as sustainable. Well, that just about rounds it up. Now, if anyone has questions... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between a professor and two students who are preparing for an English literature test. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good morning, Lorna and Ian. I'm glad that you both chose to make it. You're the only two who took their names down for this literature test. So let's get started, shall we? I would like to go through some aspects of the novel, The Secret Garden, with you before the test next week. Do take some notes and feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Hey, Lorna, have you got a spare pen? Yeah, here you are. All right. So the story follows two key characters. You should refer to them as protagonists, who go by the names of Mary Lennox and Colin Craven. The story is set shortly after the turn of the 20th century, and the narrative tracks the development of the protagonists as they learn to overcome their own personal troubles together. That's quite a common storyline, isn't it? Yes, you're right, Lorna. Could you share something you already know about the character of Mary? Well, in the beginning, she is an angry and rude child who is orphaned after a cholera outbreak and forced to leave India for the United Kingdom to go to her uncle's house in Yorkshire. Exactly. There she comes across Colin, who spends his days in an isolated room, believing himself to be permanently crippled and with no hope of ever possibly walking. The two strike up a friendship and gradually learn by encouraging each other that both of them can have a healthy, happy and fulfilled life. Is there any need for us to remember these details for the exam? Just the fundamental structure. 
Examiners don't want to read a plot summary. They know what the book is about. Focus on narrative techniques instead, such as point of view. What does that mean? It's all about how we see the story. For example, it's written based on what is called an omniscient narrator, which means all-knowing. So readers can feel the same as how all the characters do about things, including what they like and don't like, and what their motivations are in the story. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Won't it be difficult to perform a technical analysis? After all, it's a kids' book. Well, it was initially pitched at adults, you know, but over the years it has shifted to a more youth-oriented work. In this case, your understanding is correct in some way. The simple lexical items and absence of foreshadowing make the story relatively to follow. And supposedly suited for children, but that doesn't mean there isn't much to analyze. Look at the symbolism, for instance. Symbols are things, right? Material things like objects that stand for abstract ideas. Absolutely right. The author also uses many of them. There's the robin redbreast, for example, which symbolizes the wise and gentle nature that Mary will soon adopt. Note that the robin is regarded as not at all like the birds in India. Roses are treated as well as a personal symbol for Mistress Craven. You'll see that they're always mentioned alongside her name, and Mistress Craven's portrait can also be interpreted as a symbol of her spirit. Are symbols just another name for motifs? No, motifs are a bit different. They don't have a direct connection with something the way a symbol does. Motifs are simply recurring elements of the story that support the mood. Are there any in this novel? Yes, very key ones. The Garden of Eden is a motif, which comes up a few times in association with the Garden of the story, and then you've got the role that secrets play in the story. At the very beginning, everything is steeped in secrecy, and slowly the characters share their secrets, and in the process move from darkness to light, metaphorically, but also in the case of Colin, quite literally. His room used to have the curtains drawn, but in the end, he appears in the brightness of the garden. Anything else we need to know about? Yes, nearly all novels explore universal concepts that everyone has witnessed. Things like love, family, loneliness, friendship. These are called themes. The Secret Garden has a few themes that all concentrate on the idea of connections. The novel explores, for example, the way that health can determine and be determined by our outlook on life. As Colin's health conditions improve, so do his perceptions of his strength and possibility. The author also examines the relationship between our surroundings and our physical and spiritual prosperity. The dark, cramped rooms of the manor house stifle the development of our protagonists. The garden and natural environments allow them to blossom, just as the flowers do. Finally, this book looks at the connections between individuals, namely Mary and Colin. This necessity of human companionship is the novel's most important theme, because none of their development as individuals would have appeared without. They're knowing each other. Well, that about sums it up, I think. That's a great help. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear a postgraduate psychology student presenting his investigation report to other students about a job satisfaction study. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Today I would like to talk about an assignment that I did recently. The brief of my presentation will analyse the methods used in a small survey about job satisfaction and then to put forward some suggestions for further research in a similar field. The correlation between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction among employees have been investigated in the study I conducted. For this reason, employees at a call centre have been interviewed by filling in a questionnaire about their work. Now I'll briefly introduce the summary of the study findings. One primary conclusion I've got is female full-time workers gain slightly higher levels of job satisfaction again than male ones. More interestingly, among all the female workers, female workers on a part-time basis reported somewhat higher levels of satisfaction than the full-time ones did. On the contrary, from the perspective of male employees, part-time male workers held slightly less job satisfaction than how much the full-time ones felt. Although it seemed these results sounded interesting and capable of explanation, perhaps the most crucial thing to mention here is that in statistical terms they were inconclusive. I was personally shocked at the fact that the results hadn't been more definite, because I would have predicted to see both men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would go into various levels of satisfaction. Therefore, I should pay higher attention to the methodology applied by the researchers to figure out where problems may have arisen. So the next part of the presentation today is detailed aspects of what I found. First, it is probable that the sample size was too small, since the total number of workers who did the questionnaire in the survey was 223, which perhaps sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into several subgroups. Also, between the separate subgroups, the numbers were unequal. For instance, in the full-time group there are 154 samples, but only 69 in the part-time group, and only 10 of them in the part-time group were male, compared to the rest of 59 who were female. In addition, although quite a large quantity of workers were interviewed in the survey, the response had been disappointingly low, with a couple of them just ignoring the invitation, and workers who did respond may have differed in important perspectives from those who didn't. Also, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call centre for distribution, the researchers had had minimal control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For example, their responses to questions may have caused the results to be biased. In the last part of my assignment, there were some possible suggestions made for a similar study which attempts to remove the problems that I've just mentioned before. First, a target sample size should be much larger and consideration should be taken to make sure equal numbers of both genders and both full-time and part-time workers are surveyed. Second, the researchers should recheck that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves, and they should require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions, so that the likelihood of the impacts from other colleagues is eliminated. Finally, as workers may be unwilling to mention the details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's critical that the researchers reassure them their responses will be kept confidential, and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time, if they want to. In this case, it is possible that the responses to the questionnaires get increasing reliability and any comparisons that are made are more valid. Well, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test.
In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Hey everybody, your name here, and listen, let's talk eelts. You know that moment when you're sitting across from the examiner and it feels like a comedy open mic night, except no one's laughing yet? Yeah, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, which is still stained from the stress sweat, by the way. But fear not, my friends, because today we're going to break down the eelts speaking test, like it's a bad boy band from the 90s, into manageable, hilarious, and dare I say, fun little pieces. These tips are so good, you'll be speaking English smoother than a buttered crumpet sliding down a rainbow. Let's do this. Oh, all right, picture this. You're on stage, the spotlight's hot, and you've got a killer joke about a penguin who walks into a library. You wouldn't stop mid-punchline to, like, ponder the meaning of life, right? Same goes for the IELTS, my friends. Fluency is key. Think of it like this. You're telling a story and the examiner is your captive audience. Keep it flowing, keep it natural, and most importantly, keep it funny. Don't be afraid to let your personality shine through. Think of it as a conversation, not an interrogation. Unless, of course, you're into that kind of thing. No judgment here, just keep it PG, okay? Okay, folks, let's talk vocabulary. Using the same old boring words is like showing up to a first date in your grandma's sweatpants. Comfortable, maybe, but not going to win you any prizes. This is your chance to impress. Think of your vocabulary like a buffet of delicious words. You've got your fancy appetizers, that's your sophisticated synonyms, your hearty main courses, those are your powerful verbs, and of course dessert, idioms and phrasal verbs, baby. Don't be afraid to mix it up and show off your linguistic prowess. Just uh, maybe avoid using words you don't fully understand unless you want to end up like that. One time I tried to order escargot thinking it was like a type of croissant. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. Chapter 3. Grammatical range and accuracy. Don't make me grammar police you. Grammar, grammar, grammar. I know, I know. It's the part that makes everyone sweat a little. But trust me, it doesn't have to be a total buzzkill. Think of it like this. Grammar is the secret code that unlocks fluent English. It's like the difference between saying I went to the store and store me go, uh, yesterday. See, one of those sentences makes you sound like a rock star. The other, not so much. But hey, even rock stars make mistakes, right? The key is to practice, practice, practice. And if you do slip up, just laugh it off. After all, a well-placed whoopsie daisy can be pretty charming. Just ask my grandma. She's got away with murder using that phrase. Chapter 4. Pronunciation, it's all about the sounds, baby. All right, let's talk pronunciation, because let's face it, there's nothing funnier than a good old-fashioned mispronunciation. I mean, who could forget that time I accidentally called Aretha Reef on national television? A classic Fallon, am I right? But in all seriousness, pronunciation is super important for the ilts. You want to make sure you're understood and that you're not accidentally saying something totally different from what you mean. Unless, of course, you're going for the comedic effect, in which case, go for it. My advice, listen to native speakers, practice tongue twisters, and don't be afraid to exaggerate those sounds. The more you practice, the more confident you'll become. And who knows, you might even discover a hidden talent for accents. Just don't blame me if you start speaking in a British accent after watching too much Downton Abbey. Chapter 5, Time Management, TikTok, Don't Let the Clock Mock. Last but not least, let's talk time management, because nobody wants to be that person who's still rambling on about their pet goldfish when the examiner's already calling for their next victim. Uh, I mean, candidate. The key here is to be concise, to the point, and to avoid going off on tangents. Unless, of course, that tangent involves a hilarious story about a squirrel stealing your lunch. Then, by all means, proceed. 
Practice answering questions within the time limit and don't be afraid to politely steer the conversation back on track if you feel like you're veering off course. Remember, you've got this. Just channel your inner time management guru and you'll be golden. Outro, go forth and conquer my ilks champions. So there you have it, folks. My top secret, totally foolproof. Okay, maybe not foolproof, but definitely fun proof. Tips for acing the ilts speaking test. Remember, practice makes perfect. So grab a friend, order some pizza, and have yourselves a good old-fashioned IELTS study party. And hey, if you happen to use one of my jokes during the exam, just make sure to give me credit, or at least tell the examiner to tune into The Tonight Show. Who knows, maybe they'll give you bonus points for good taste. Good luck, my friends, and may the odds of scoring an 8-plus be ever in your favor.